can sell it. However, I do want to make sure we all know what we're in for this afternoon. So with that said, let's dive in. As Stacy mentioned, I am very fortunate to be the director of the Batavia Depot Museum just down the road. I know I've recognized some faces in the crowd from our volunteer corps and members of our historical society. Thank you for coming out today to support us. We do all kinds of amazing programming at the museum, including exhibits. We collect, preserve, and interpret Batavia's local history. So we don't just specialize in depot history or rail history. We cover a wide range of topics, including the folks who came before us here. This year, we are piloting a new program of cemetery walks and cemetery tours, a very respectful take through our cemeteries on the east side and the west side of town. For our spring program at Memorial Day, we did a tour at the west side that involved the Newton War Memorial and the Civil War veterans who are buried at the west side cemetery. It was super interesting. I would love for you folks to join us for our upcoming tours in October. On Saturday the 14th, we're going to be taking a look through the east side cemetery. And as any good researcher, any good historian does, before I talk to you guys about it, I want to know everything there is to know about a topic. So I typically start researching a new project by looking at the research materials that we already have at the museum. But then my second or maybe third step is to come over to the library and pull every book I can off the shelf that might be related to the subject. This book in particular was recommended to me as a social history of the American cemetery. And I wanted to learn more about how Batavia's cemeteries and gravekeeping fit into a larger picture of how Americans have cared for our dead. What I found was a surprisingly delightful, heartwarming, deeply human, and very moving portrait of the ways our care of the dead reflect our values as a society. And I think in some surprising ways. So Mr. Melville, the author of the book, um, is a journalist. He's not a historian. And automatically, that's a red flag for me. I like a nice, meaty text that's full of references, that's full of footnotes. Melville doesn't really write that way. He's much more interested in relating a narrative or an experience. But he is so good at doing what history lovers like best, which is drawing connections and through lines from one part of history to another, things that can resonate down to us in the present day. He's fantastic at finding threads of stories in the facts of history and pulling them together into a compelling overall narrative. So each chapter of the book, and there are 17 of them, introduces one graveyard or cemetery as sort of the focal point of the chapter, but very rarely is he only talking about one graveyard. Because in most chapters, he's relating them to other contemporary burial practices, how the dead were interred, how they were cared for. It really doesn't focus on funerary rites or um, preservation of the dead, except to sort of explain why cemeteries were designed and set up the way they were. So if you're looking for a text that's more about mourning customs, this one's probably not gonna cut it for you. But if you're interested in a very early days, all the way up until the present, look at how we design the spaces for our dead, this is right up your alley. I have pulled a quote here from him to give you sort of a sense of his prose. This is in the first chapter, which is about the colonists at Jamestown and how they set up their um, internments compared to the Algonquian-speaking peoples who were there previously. So the quote is that all graveyards reflect, both above and below the surface, how the people who created and populated them approached death and life. There's an honesty to these places if you're willing to look because the dead don't have a deceitful bone in their bodies, which I think is a really nice summation of sort of how, um, how much double entendre there is in his writing, how much of it is in sort of poetic style. Um, it's very factual, but he's good at summarizing larger ideas into sort of pithy statements. So as we go through the presentation today, I'm gonna to pull a quote from each of the chapters to give you kind of a flavor of the writing style. We're going to start off with uh, two of, I think, more the weighty chapters of the book. They're right up at the front, um, so I knew right away what I was getting myself into. Uh, very fascinating topics. We're going to start with Burial Hill. So the book is organized roughly chronologically, starting with Jamestown and then moving up into the present day. So chapter one, of course, addresses the first European colonial settlement. Chapter two then tells the story of the Pilgrims. It tells the story of the settlement at Plymouth. 
He uses Burial Hill Cemetery as his focal site, established in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 18, oh, sorry, 1622. The Pilgrims arrived to colonize the Cape Cod area in 1620, shortly after the Great Dying, which is a pandemic that decimated the Algonquian people from Maine all the way down to Rhode Island and left a wake of empty villages and graveyards in their place. The Pilgrims directly benefited in the wake of this disaster, and they settled on the abandoned remains of a Wampanoag farming village with cleared fields, ready for planting, ideal spot. However, despite the head start, the winter was brutal, supplies were thin, the settlers had very few of the necessary skills to survive in this new land. And then we get the quote from uh, Melville, the elements, malnutrition, and diseases caused 50 out of the original 102 Mayflower passengers to die before spring arrived. What saved the rest from extinction during this time was grave robbery. There was a landing party in 1620 that found locations of newly turned earth. They were on the hunt for treasure, so they thought maybe there were buried jewels or gold, decided to dig up these turned earth areas and found instead of treasures, graves. However, in the graves, the Wampanoag were custom, accustomed to burying their dead with tools that they would need for their journey into the afterlife. So grain, corn, tools, weapons, anything that might be necessary. Very helpful for a bunch of colonists who had no food. So they wound up taking the grave goods and pillaging the sites. One of the colonists remarked, it's sure and sure it was God's good providence that we found this corn, for else we know not how we should have done. They pillaged the grave goods, promising to return what they replenished when they, uh, they wanted to return what they had taken out of respect for the dead, and they made the vow to do that. They never kept that vow. Those grave goods were never returned. By February, for the pilgrims, death was an almost daily occurrence. Burials were hastily conducted at night. Bodies deposited into unmarked graves on Coles Hill, which was later covered over with crops and entirely forgotten about. Until about a century later, heavy floods revealed the bones. And this is in keeping with the pilgrims' ideals of the earthly vessel being simply a vessel. It is not something we revere. It is not something we make an icon out of. It is just a vessel for an eternal spirit. In spring 1621, the surviving settlers made contact with a man named Asi Usamakwin, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and I apologize if I'm not, uh, who was a representative of the Wampanoag. The Wampanoag were one of the peoples in the area who had been devastated by the pandemic. They were short on people and political capital, and they were being threatened on their south by the Narragansett people. So they entered into a temporary uh, flimsy sort of truce with these European settlers. The settlers were fortunately blessed with food aid. They got survival assistance out of this relationship, and the Wampanoag had sort of the backing of this external force as they were entering into negotiations with the Narragansett. The settlers survived. They got through that first winter in thanks. They decided to build a church, and right next to the church, they built their very first cemetery, which is Burial Hill. You can see that here in the picture on the left. And someone told me I had a laser pointer. Ha ha, there we go. So this is Burial Hill. Most of those earlier graves were not marked at all. This is mostly later headstones that you'll see here. This picture here is more typical of the uh, Algonquian burial customs. This is the final resting place of Assumquin's remains in Warren, Rhode Island, in a city park now called Burr's Hill. So this is what it would have looked like in about 1770 before all of those mounds and graves were pillaged. Uh, this is his memorial stone that's left at the site. As colonization spread, that temporary truce wound up collapsing. Assemaquin's son, who's also probably better known as Little Philip, or King Philip, um, started a very bloody conflict with European settlers was decimated after that, and his remains um, at his death were displayed publicly as a shame to his people and to reduce the hoped to reduce any potential um, continuation of violence. The son of Quinn's remains were laid to rest with his ancestors in a 2,500 year old sacred burial ground in Warren, Rhode Island, depicted here. 
until his remains and those of 42 others who were buried with him were unearthed in 1851 in order to make way for a new railroad construction. His remains were not returned to his people until about 2017, at which point they were reinterred. So heavy stuff, big topics. We're talking about the foundation of America, we're talking about colonization, relationships with uh, native peoples, and I think it's a really nice way to start off our talk today because it gives you a little flavor of kind of what you're in for in this book. It's a great chapter for laying out historical facts, what we know about what took place, compares it to other contemporary practices, and then broadens the theme to address ongoing present day issues. Um, just a couple, you get a little bit of a breather, and then a couple chapters later we get Monticello, which is another really tough one. Monticello is an interesting chapter in the book because Melville uses it to compare and contrast um, the treatment of the dead at different points in American history depending on your class or your status or your creed or your color. He does this throughout the book, which I think is a really interesting way to go. Some of the chapters focus a little more on the development of different styles of cemetery design and layout. We're gonna get into that in a little bit. But this is another chapter that I wanted to use to tell you a little bit about some of the weightier topics he deals with. This one focuses very specifically on the meaning of two cemeteries at one location. So we have here on the left-hand side of the screen, Thomas Jefferson's Egyptian-influenced granite obelisk behind a lovely massive iron gate um, marks the burial site of Thomas Jefferson and his descendants. It's engraved with the long list of Jefferson's accomplishments and his influence on American life. It is still an active burial ground. It is maintained by the Monticello Association, which is mostly comprised of descendants, direct descendants of Thomas Jefferson um, through the line of his wife Martha and her daughter. On the other hand, we also have the recently rediscovered gravesite of enslaved African Americans who worked at Monticello. It was completely forgotten for years and years and years. Nobody knew that it was there. It was entirely unmarked. Holds the estimated remains of 40 adults and children who were enslaved at Monticello. Um, Melville is not shy at all about his condemnation of this practice, and rightly so. But he does talk about how the way that the remains were cared for after death reveals the fact that the people who were exploiting this labor knew what they were doing and did not want people to look at it. Jefferson knew that his gravesite was going to be remembered. People were going to come and visit him. He wanted a memorial uh, appropriate to his status. He did not want people to explore or look at the graves of his enslaved workers. Southern plantation owners like Jefferson took active measures to keep African-American graveyards and funeral practices on their properties out of general sight and mind. To drive the point home, Melville talks about the fact that not all of Jefferson's descendants are welcome in the family burial ground. His children by Sally Hemings are not permitted to be buried at that site. To find Sally Hemings' grave, Melville traveled to the parking lot of a Hampton Inn in Charlottesville, Virginia. The property had once been home of Easton Hemings, Thomas Jefferson's son, by his enslaved servant and wife's half-sister, Sally Hemings. Easton owned the home after being freed in Jefferson's will in 1827 and lived there with his mother until her death in 1835. In the 19th century in Virginia, free African Americans in the South were usually buried in the yard where they lived. They were not permitted to buy community burial spaces. They were not permitted to have funerary customs. So while Sally Hemings' final resting place has not been recorded, we do not know exactly where it is, we do believe it's likely that she rests below that paved parking lot in Charlottesville. Okay, take a breath, shake it up. We're gonna switch gears a little bit. We're gonna talk a little bit about Mount Auburn. And we're gonna move now into a couple of slides that discuss some of the chapters where Melville is laying out different design styles for cemeteries and how those evolved over the 19th century into what we recognize today as sort of the memorial park style of the early 20th century. So we're gonna start with Mount Auburn. Mount Auburn uh, really changed the game for cemetery design and established what we now today refer to as the rural style cemetery that became the model for cemeteries across the country. Batavia cemeteries are very much in this rural cemetery style. This one in particular was located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 
founded in 1831 as part wildlife reserve, part public park, part burial ground. But all of these tasks all looped in together. It's widely known as uh, one of the country's first city parks. It was intended to be a melding of nature and a melding of human life and human decency. But originally it was started out um, by a bird watching society who wanted to preserve some space that they could go and watch a bunch of birds. So the um, instigators of the cemetery got together people who were all gonna buy land together, go into this as a joint venture, and everyone was gonna be a shareholder in this. You would be able to come out, watch birds, have this lovely experience in the countryside in um, Massachusetts, which was, the Boston area was rapidly developing. They were losing wild space. So this was a, a place where you could go during your life, and then eventually you would have a plot there where you could be buried. Um, the founder of the cemetery absolutely sold out all of the other investors in the game plan in order to make a buck, and that's a trend we're going to see as we go through cemetery history. But Mount Auburn is still an active burial ground. It's still well maintained, and you can still go and visit it. The picture here is as it looks today, but it was iconic at the time that it was constructed as this height of rural beauty. Even in a city environment, you could get away a little bit and get out into the greenery. Uh, one of the next parks that he talks about is Greenwood Park. With the emergence of rural cemeteries, everyone got a gravestone, and the elite often went to great lengths for their memorials to be memorable. Greenwood took funerary art to a whole new level. This is an excellent example, 1838, of sort of a Gothic revival style. You can see um, one of the original artist's renderings of what it would have looked like back in the day, and then um, a picture from around 1890 of visitors, tourists, just touring through Greenwood. And that's something that I think we don't think about as often today. Cemeteries seem to be places kind of beyond where you want to go and hang out. But historically, for Auburn and Greenwood, they were intended to be places where people would come and visit for no reason other than to be in a beautiful space. So Greenwood and Auburn both, and this is a little gruesome, bought remains from famous people to reinter in their own properties as a draw. You know, you gotta have a headliner for your cemetery. Somebody famous who everyone knows, get them in the door. Um, with the goal, of course, of selling those plots down the line. So if you could bring people in and they could see a beautiful space and, oh my gosh, there's a Rockefeller right over there, then that makes a big deal. So a lot of these early cemeteries were populated by reinterred um, remains of poets, authors, actors, anyone who had any shred of fame or notoriety. This would be a, a, a way for the early cemetery leaders to um, get a little clout. So Greenwood was, a sort of rural retreat for the citizens of New York. They wanted a place where they could go and have all of this lovely architecture and art around them. We know that a number of famous folks spent a lot of their waking hours at Greenwood because it was so lovely, including Walt Whitman, who, uh, when he wrote uh, Song of Myself, which is probably his most famous work, talks specifically about being in these natural spaces where the grass grows as the uncut hair of graves. Maybe it's a little literal. Melville's trying to argue that like that's the inspiration. He spent all of his time here at Greenwood, um, and so that inspired Song of Myself, which I think if that's the, the reading you want to go with, it, it changes very much the tone of that poem. It becomes a lot more um, humorous and irreverent uh, than if you're imagining it as sort of a, it sort of pokes fun at transcendentalism rather than taking it extremely seriously. Um, so Greenwood was another uh, one of those early rural park spaces that functioned as a city park. Then Woodlawn comes along. And Woodlawn, um, Greenwood is established in Brooklyn, New York. Woodlawn is in, Bron in the Bronx. And it's established about a generation later. Greenwood is 1838. Woodlawn is 1863. And Woodlawn is following what would a century later be the model for suburban development. So I've got the map on here so that you can kind of see the, the layout of streets that wind through 
Um, everyone gets their own space. It's not rows and rows and rows of graves all right next to each other. So you tend to get these curving, sweeping walks with like little houses all along it, these little mausoleums that decorate the walkway in a very similar way to today when we think about driving down a suburban street and you've got everybody's little house. Everybody took a lot of care to design their little mausoleum so that it would be keeping up with the Joneses. There's a lot of fashion that goes into this and a lot of clout. And then maintaining the landscaping around it as well. So it's very much following what we would a century later see in the development of suburban areas too. What I find most interesting about Woodlawn is the way it's set up on the back end. So they initially started a private land investment firm, a real estate company that would purchase the land. And then they had a separate nonprofit cemetery board, cemetery foundation, to purchase it again from them, effectively dodging all taxes on the transactions. A very common scheme for cemeteries. So if you can buy the land, you can sell it to your own nonprofit and pay no tax on that transaction. Um, kind of the model for how to make money in cemeteries at the time was that land speculation. This is a, a much later development, the Forest Lawn Memorial Park. This is not a cemetery, this is not a graveyard, this is a memorial park. And Melville makes, um, goes, I, I wouldn't say he goes to great lengths. The comparison is definitely there, but as he's writing through this chapter, the number of times he mentions magical kingdom, or theme park, or Disney specifically, who is buried here, um, is pretty incredible. He's making the argument that uh, Forest Lawn Memorial Park is the model for what would eventually become Disneyland. It is a theme park. Um, so there's a couple of interesting things about its founder, Hubert Eaton. Uh, the park was set up in 1917, just a couple of years after Los Angeles finished completing uh, their aqueduct system, which meant Los Angeles exploded in population. So many people moved in. Uh, lots of pressure on the housing market, lots of pressure on real estate. So Eaton realized that he could make a lot more money not selling property for houses, but selling property for graves because you only need 30 square feet. So if he can offer 30 square feet at a time to people, even at $10 a plot, he could make a much greater return on investment than if he sold the land to developers. He had some pretty specific ideals of how he wanted his memorial park to look, though. You can see here um, in this picture these sort of lines of flat, just straight, um, these are all bronze plaques that sit flush into the ground. They do not protrude up over the ground. So when you are looking across the memorial park, you do not see any evidence of a grave. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. Eaton felt very strongly that he didn't want anything that would remind anybody of death in his theme park, <laughs> which I think is a little ironic, but very interesting because he wanted a space that was full of light and life and was a place where people would come and spend their days not reflecting on death, but reflecting on the beauty of life around you. So he also fills his property with reproduction statues uh, from across the world. He's making these copies and bringing them to install here at his cemetery as a way to attract people in. And he does tend to group them in themes. So he has a whole section of the park that's called Baby Land. And he's got a section of the park that's called the wee Kirk of the Green. And it's like this Scottish medieval fantasy. And like he has these different areas, very reminiscent of Tomorrowland in Disney World. Um, and he's, he's directly responsible for a lot of those ideas that then Disney would borrow. They were friends, they knew each other. Eventually Disney would be buried here. His grave is in this cemetery. Um, so Eaton not only developed the idea of like invisible graves and themed areas, so you could sort of pick where you wanted your eternal resting spot to be. He also realized that if he just waited for natural processes to fill the graveyard, he was not going to make money fast enough. So he invented the idea of pre-need sales, which is still something commonly done in cemetery in the cemetery industry today. If you are 
grieving, you are experiencing a loss, um, you are maybe a little more vulnerable, but also a little more desperate, so you're going to take whatever you can get. For pre-need sales, Eaton was trying to offer, in his words, security, peace of mind, you know where you're going to be, your children don't have to worry about it, and I get my cash up front. I'm, I'm making sure that I'm getting back mine. So he's selling marketing to active, healthy people rather than those at the end of their life. Um, very successful, works out really well for him and becomes the model that is still used today. In fact, almost all new memorial, almost all new cemeteries are designed in this fashion where the gravestones sit flush into the ground, partly because of the view, but also partly because it's cheaper to maintain. You can just run your lawnmower straight over the top of them and nobody's gonna mind. Uh, when you've got all those little intricate areas, I know we've got some folks in the crowd today who are experts at caring for old graves, um, and it's a challenge. It's very difficult to do. Once the people who are related to that person are no longer around, um, very rarely is there anyone who's going out and meticulously caring for gravestones, headstones, um, and grave sites. So today, um, and in this section, um, Melville talks specifically about how Forest Long really corporatized mourning in America in a way that no one had ever seen before and opens the door to aggressive sales and marketing and a tsunami of revenues for the modern death industrial complex, which is a term I've heard before. Uh, there's a couple of really interesting creators on YouTube who make films about what's it like to be a mortician, what's it like to be involved in the death industry. I think those are really fascinating. Um, I'm not sure what that says about me, but uh, I, like, I, like, uh, I like history and old things, so it's interesting to, to see how that's changed over time. But the American um, death industrial complex, as he calls it, is very consolidated. There is one company, Hill & Brand Incorporated, that produces 45% of all the caskets in the United States, and Service Corporation International specializes in funeral homes and cemeteries. They have 1,500 funeral homes, 480 cemeteries, and out of every dollar an American spends on death services and funeral expenses, they get 16 cents. So it's a huge market share um, for them. And there, there are very few providers out there in the, in the modern community. So that um, kind of brings us up into the present day for cemetery design. There's one more that I think is maybe the next step in that uh, progression that we'll get to at the end. But I wanted to take a slight detour to focus on Arlington, because I think this is Melville's strongest chapter. Melville is a veteran of the Navy. He fought in the, he was deployed in the Afghanistan war. He's still an active uh, member of the Navy reserves. So he has a very personal and vested interest in talking about Arlington and what that means to him and what that means to the country. He says very succinctly to be buried in its soil, Arlington soil, is to be instantly and forever mythologized for right or wrong. It is one of our biggest military recruiting tools and the subject of songs and poems. Um, he talks a little bit about that later in the chapter. I'll mention that if we've got a moment, but uh, this is, I think, a really interesting chapter. Just the way he's constructed it, it, it is, and I think it's true of most of his chapters, they can be very self-contained. You can just read one at a time, or he could publish just one at a time as an article. But in this case, Arlington, he starts off by describing his chaperoning his daughter's field trip to Washington, D.C. He's making these bids to connect with his daughter. He's giving her dad jokes. How many dead people are in a cemetery? All of them, ha, ha, ha. Um, daughter is having none of it. So a lot of his chapters talk with, start with him visiting a site in person and then sort of elaborating back on his understanding of the context of the cemetery and then trying to draw a connection back to his present day life. And that happens in this chapter too. So he starts out by talking to his middle school aged daughter, trying to connect with her about his interest in cemeteries, things that he's personally invested in. She's not into it. So he goes off and kind of explores on his own. It's uh, very clear from the way he writes that he is a little bit in awe of sort of the mythology that goes along with Arlington. And he talks a lot about um, things like lots of classical Greek um, references. He's 
trying to respond, or he's trying to call to mind, or the, the cemetery is trying to call to mind Homer and the Odyssey and the Iliad and classical heroes of old and make this connection to the American military as well. The history that he tells about Arlington developing early on is fascinating. Arlington was established in 1864 at the height of the Civil War, partly due to just the necessity of dealing with the casualties, which were enormous. And very rarely were people able to be uh, to have their remains sent home for traditional burials in line with a good death as the way 19th century America considered it. That you would die in your home with the people around you who loved you, you would be buried in your own churchyard or in your own cemetery and your family could go and visit you. Well, in places like Gettysburg, we have the first establishment of a national cemetery battlefield um, just to deal with the number of dead who could not be returned back home to their families. Arlington is in the mold of that. What I think is interesting about where it is, is that this was property that was abandoned by the Lee family, Robert E. Lee, who was the general for the South. So as an incredible nose-thumbing move, the Union officers um, took the property, um, commandeered the property, and the first thing that they did with it was establish a freedman's village about 10,000 African Americans who were displaced by the war and found homes for them there. It was a, a pretty well-established village initially. And then the second thing they did with it was fill it with corpses. So right in Lee's front yard, they established the first section of the cemetery as a way to say, even if you win this war, you will never have a home here again, um, which I think is a little chilling. The Eventually, the Lee family, his descendants, regain control of the property. They get it back from the government, um, but aren't able to sustain it. They're not able to continue to, to operate it. So they wind up selling the property back to the Department of Defense. And the person who signs the papers for that transaction is Robert Todd Lincoln, who is Abraham Lincoln's son. So Robert E. Lee's son signs over the paperwork to Lincoln's son in the sort of next generation of how do we move on from this issue? How do we move past uh, the conflict of the Civil War? And today it is very well regarded as a national cemetery, a national park, where everyone who's been involved in the military has a place. Uh, one of the reasons is because it's just massive. Uh, the other really notable feature about Arlington is everything is exactly the same. Everything is very regimented. The lines are very straight. All the headstones are identical. They might have some differentiation for religious um, beliefs by the engravings that are on the, the headstones. But for the most part, they fit one specific mold. And we've got the Tomb of the Unknowns as well, which helped to further mythologize the idea of combat and of warfare and create this sort of iconic heroic status that even it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what your beliefs were, if you fought in this military, you get to borrow some of this glory from the people who uh, sacrificed and gave their lives. Arlington is filling up. Uh, they are discussing how they're going to accommodate the fact that there are not enough room, there's not enough room left. The policy has always been that anyone who had active service or anyone who had military status is allowed to be interred there. They're talking about how do we decide who's really worthy of Arlington? Does it have to be someone with a Purple Heart or a Medal of Honor? Or how do we distinguish who gets a space in this sort of glorified um, temple? So Melville is very personal in this chapter. He, the title of the chapter is um, it is fitting and good to die for one's country, which is a reference back to classical poetry as well. There's this, um, this line um, that talks about how sweet it is to die for your homeland, which has been co-opted throughout the years to kind of talk about uh, pro patria mori, uh, delecta est. It's very sweet to die for your fatherland. And he talks about how once death has come to you, you no longer care what has happened to you. <laughs> and it's a, it's, he talks a lot about how effective this cemetery can be as a tool of recruitment and propaganda. And that like, if you are involved in this, you've, you've earned some kind of glory through your service that you get to join the ranks of the heroic. Um, so it's a very interesting chapter. 
he ends it by trying to reach back out to his daughter and share all of this understanding and wisdom that he has about his perspective on Arlington and what it means to him as a veteran and what he thinks it means to the country. Um, so watching him kind of talk about that experience through the book is um, a really, I feel very close to Greg. Uh, and if he wants to go cemetery walking with me someday, give me a call, because I would absolutely do it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna finish off our presentation today with my favorite cemetery in the book, that if I'm gonna go somewhere over in one of these, this is the one I'm gonna pick, because it looks like a library. <laughs> This is called the Chapel of the Chimes. Chapel of the Chimes is in Oakland, California. It was constructed in 1929 by California's first licensed female architect. Her name was Julia Morgan. She also designed the Hearst Castle, which is gorgeous if you've been there. Um, and it, just the way it's laid out, there are no corridors. Every room spills into every other room. It just is this sort of unfolding space that's uh, very reminiscent of like monastery designs. Um, everything is very connected to each other. There's bookcases that separate rooms, but you can sort of see through them. Um, and then all of the urns, not all of the urns, but many of the urns are shaped like the spines of books. So you have these sort of stories of people's lives in this very metaphorical way. And I just, I think it's charming, but also beautiful. It's borrowing a lot of the vernacular and the vocabulary of Spanish missions, um, to create this medieval style of space. So in, in this chapter, Melville talks specifically about the rise of cremation and that it's one of the answers to the pressing need of space in cemeteries. How do we fit more people in when our land is not expanding? Our land is static. So he gives the figure that in 1960, about 3% of deaths resulted in cremation. By 2020, it was 56%. And partly that's to help reduce end of life expenses. Um, it's much cheaper to go with a cremation wrap than it is to go with a standard burial, casket, vaults, all of those sorts of things. And it means that you can fit more bodies into a space, so the cost of the plots is usually much less. Um, I know Batavia just recently invested in a columbarium for our West Side Cemetery, which does exactly that. It's a storehouse for urns, so instead of buying a plot of land, you can buy a, a nook um, for your urn to go. And we're talking about how to decorate that and how to get some art onto that. So it's um, a lovely, beautiful space to be, as well as a significant and memorable space to be. So, um, Mr. Mayor, if you're looking at design work, um, call Julia Morgan, and I will be the first to buy in. <laughs> But it is, it is just a lovely space. And I liked uh, the way he talked about it being sort of a contemplative space, a contemplative realm that's a little different from modern day life. It's a quieter space. I have been absolutely charmed by my walks through the West and East Side cemeteries here in Batavia. The art in them is fantastic. Some of the really older spots are so beautiful in terms of the funerary art that goes with them, the gravestones that are there. And every time I go, I feel like I'm meeting somebody new and I want to know more about them. I'm like, hey, that's a really cool headstone. I want to go research whoever um, Mr. Moore was and find out what his story was because um, he's sort of spoken to me over the years. So I, I feel like it's a, a really great way to connect with our roots as a community and really uh, feel like you're part of a longer tradition. It's one of the reasons I love going out there and visiting those spaces. Um, so I would love to invite you to come hang out with me at the library anytime you'd like, or uh, hang out with me at the museum anytime you'd like. Uh, if you have follow-up questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them here in person. Or if you have additional ones, here's my contact information up on the sheet here. Uh, thank you so much for coming out and joining me today for our lovely little talk. I've been delighted to share this book with you. I hope um, you've learned a little bit of the immense amount of information that is tucked into this book. I highly encourage that you go pick it up. You cannot borrow the library's copy because my dog liked it too. Uh, so I have to pay for a book. I am so sorry. Um, but they should be getting a brand new nice one for the shop very shortly. So, um, 
but it's uh, it was it was really good. It's available on Amazon as well. But of course, I, I think the best place to go for your books is the library. So um, at this point, I'd love to open it up to all of you to see if there are questions for me. I will let you know that there is so much in here that if it's a specific question, I'm just going to point you to the book. But um, please shoot shoot go for it. What was the last place? Chapel of the Chimes. Do they have chimes in there? I don't know why Chapel of the Chimes. I'm not sure what the um, what the name is for. He doesn't explain it in the book. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Ask Ask Greg. <laughs> uh, I see another hand in the back. Yes. I'm halfway through the book. Oh, great. It's one of the most fascinating books that I've ever read. I'm telling you, I love it. Um, but I'm never read the question. Yes. What is your favorite cemetery here in the video? Oh, um, great question. So we have um, the East Side Cemetery is a little bit older. Uh, it was started like three years ahead of the West Side Cemetery, not by much, but, but a little bit. They were both started in the 1840s. Um, neither one of them, as far as I can tell, was ever designed as like a real estate scheme the way that Greenwood was. Um, they were definitely more community service oriented, that first and, and any money to be raised second. So the East Side Cemetery I love because um, many of the graves over there are of the African American population of Batavia, um, many of which are not marked, uh, but we have records of where um, folks are interred. It also has the memorial to the um, U.S. colored troops that fought during the Civil War. Batavia had a large contingent of African American soldiers who went down to fight. So I like that. I, I love visiting that memorial. Um, the East Side Cemetery. Yeah, so there's there's two big ones in town, East Side Cemetery and West Side Cemetery. And there's um, River Hills Memorial Park as well. There was an old burial ground at the corner of Washington and another cross street. Uh, it's got a big red house on it now. We go past it on the trolley tours that we do. Uh, it was the former home of the gentleman who owned the quarry, L.P. Barker. And that, before it was his house, was the burial site in Batavia. Most of those bodies were reinterred. So there are no, there's no graves left there that we know of, um, which is sort of an interesting conversation as well. Um, and there's some pioneer cemeteries as well out closer towards where Fermi is. Um, so there's, there's a number of little ones. I think probably my favorite is the West Side Cemetery, though, because the grave art there is, is just incredible. And it has the Newton War Memorial, which is an iconic Batavia spot. That we've got pictures in our collection of Batavians from like 1917, getting their picture taken by the memorial, lots of parades going past there. And it includes the Potter's Field, uh, which is a very interesting part of history that I didn't really dig into here, but Melville does in the book, that if you die without the means to buy a plot, you are kind of at the mercy of the rest of the community to, to find a space for you. Um, and that often winds up in things like potter's fields where you don't get a marker. Um, it's more like a mass grave. They tend to be really tightly packed. But for Batavia to have invested the space in that right from the jump is pretty remarkable. I think it says something about the community. So if I had to pick a favorite, it's probably West Side. <coughs> Mr. Hoffman. Is there a, a chapter where they discuss, and you just mentioned it, Pioneer uh, graveyard, family graveyard, lots, because there are hundreds of them, thousands of them across the country. Does he spend any time talking about these areas? It does, a little bit, um, mostly in comparison to more formal cemeteries. So in the chapter where he talks about Auburn as sort of the foundation of the modern rural style cemetery, he's comparing it to, well, before that, you either got buried in your churchyard or you got buried in your backyard. Um, and so he talks a lot about how families had family plots on their own properties in most cases. Uh, there is a little discussion in the book about like the earliest funerary customs, the earliest grave sites that we would recognize today. Um, so there is some discussion of that, mostly in comparison to um, that one is, is, that conversation is mostly in the, the chapter about the pilgrims, where he's talking about how quickly we abandoned what we thought was civilized when we were faced with um, real survival questions. That like we had been burying people in this way in Europe and we stopped doing it when we got to the new world for a little bit because we were just trying to get by. Um, so he, he compares it a little bit in that book. It's a good question. Yeah. Just to follow up, yeah. anything about when they discuss, they discuss like when you go down to New Orleans, 
and those areas where the grapes are varying in certain or the European type of style. That's a great question. Yeah, so um, what about the, the graves in, um, down in New Orleans and uh, spaces that are, he, he really focuses on New England, I would say. There are a couple, he goes to New England and then it seems like maybe he goes out to California and does California. Um, I don't think he really makes it down to New Orleans. He, he, there's not a chapter about it in the book. And I'm trying to remember if, he's, if he talks about it at any point, and not that I recall. Um, but it's a dense book, so forgive me if I, if I missed it. Um, since it is sort of part travel log, I wonder if he just, if it's on the to-do list and he just didn't get down there, or if it's so different from the rest of American um, style that maybe it wasn't something that he wanted to touch on in this particular book, but I'd love his take on it. I think that'd be really interesting. I see another hand up over there, go ahead. Have you ever visited Mooseheart Cemetery? Have I ever visited Mooseheart Cemetery? You know, every time somebody talks about Mooseheart, I'm like, I didn't know that was there. <laughs> um, it's, I, I haven't been. Tell me about it. Well, it's mostly children passed away in the early 1900s. Okay. Mostly children at the Mooseheart Cemetery, which would make sense. It's a, the child city. Visited Graceland Cemetery in Chicago? No, but we actually have some Batavians who are buried out there. So um, just across the street from us, the Gammon property, uh, Gammon House, the, the Gammon family are all down in Graceland. Um, he doesn't talk about Graceland either. And man, he's missing out. He should go, 100%. Yes? Just, yeah, Moose Heart, several years ago I worked there. Oh. And uh, a mother, of a child that had died as a child. Uh, she has to be buried next to it. And, and, and from what I can remember, there was a whole bunch of legal ease mm -hmm. as to is this proper, is this right, mm -hmm. and whatever. Yeah. And I never knew what the end of it was. So for those of you who maybe didn't get to hear it, there was a, um, an instance at Moose Heart of a parent who wanted to be interred near their child um, and lots of conversations about how do we make that happen, can we make that happen, should we make that happen. Um, because who's, who is permitted to be buried in certain places is a very prickly subject. Um, I, there's nothing in the book specifically about that, but there are, there are lots of discussions about this is the Jewish part of the cemetery, this is the African American part of the cemetery, um, and some of the ways that those early cemeteries especially functioned as very exclusive social clubs, that in order to be buried in, um, <laughs> for example, the, um, the property at Forest Lawn is full of Hollywood celebrities, but they do talk in there a little bit about the Great Mausoleum, which uh, has a specific place there called the Hall of Immortals, which is a lot. Um, and the Hall of Immortals, you can't buy your way into. You have to be elected into the Hall of Immortals by other immortals. Um, so how that works, I'm not entirely certain, but um, very exclusive. So it's, that's not uncommon at all, is to be able to say, you know, we, I don't want to spend my eternal resting near other people who are not qualified, maybe. Um, <laughs> so it, it definitely comes up. That's definitely something of a repeated conversation. Uh, the same thing true for New York City during the height of the AIDS epidemic, that people were very concerned that if you buried someone who had died of AIDS next to someone else who had not, that that was somehow going to contaminate uh, the rest of the cemetery. So there was a separate cemetery that now you can only get to by boat. You can only go out on a ferry to view those cemetery sites, um, and you have to be related to someone who is there, which is difficult to do since most of the people there did not have biological offspring. They had very close intimate friends and family, but they maybe didn't have uh, descendants. So it's a very lonely place. Yes, go ahead. You had mentioned uh, Robert Todd Lincoln. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, before Robert died at almost age 83, he and his wife had agreed that he would be buried in Springfield. Oh, with interesting. His, with his parents. Yeah. And, um, but he's not. And uh, after he passed away, uh, his wife came up 
and the witness laid out and said, Robert, I know that we agree to that you're going to be buried with your parents. Mm -hmm. However, you've been under the shadow of your father all your life. I don't think it's right for you to be under his shadow for eternity. Wow. So, and then she added with, there's two things. Uh, one, I wish you had not played golf. <laughs> I wish you had not played golf. But two, I'm going to have you buried in Arlington. And he is there, and if you go, and you would see his tomb. You would look toward Washington, D.C., past JFK's, yeah. okay? And what is in the background? They're all linked up. Make it memorial. Um, so for those of you who, who um, we should have a, a passing mic at some point for these questions. They're so good. Uh, but that was a, a lovely story about uh, Robert Todd Lincoln and his final disposition, which his wife, um, he had left instructions to be buried in Springfield with um, his father and his family. And his wife said, you need to be out of your father's shadow and had him reinterred at Arlington. Um, where he can look across the mall towards the Washington Memorial, uh, which I love. I, she seems like a very interesting person. She did a lot to protect the family after Robert Todd Lincoln's death. So, yeah, very interesting person. Another question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, is that cemetery out taking Parkway, the Catholic cemetery? Is that Geneva? Cemetery on Fabian Parkway. Out by Geneva. I'm I'm not sure. That's a great question. Yeah. It is consensus. Phone a friend. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know very much about that one. I'll have to do a little more digging, Margie. Thank you. And Aurora has at least three. I know the specific Catholic That's that's pretty pretty um, unsurprising. A lot of religious communities want to have their own parishioners, their own members, uh, close to hand. So uh, for that one, it's not just open to everybody. It's a specifically religious. <coughs> yeah. And I do think where the girls' home was up in Geneva, they found there is a There is a graveyard there as well. Yeah, very sad graveyard. I'm Lots sure of infants. Yeah. Uh, in the back, go ahead. Um, I think it's Geneva. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the grave robbing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just saw a show, a new show this summer, I guess. I just saw it like the last couple of days called Dark Marvels on the History Channel. Okay. And they had a show where it talked about um, grave yes. robbing. And the, there was one man who was the only person in the country who was the son of a U.S. president and also the father of a U.S. president, Harrison. Okay. Okay, there was uh, William Henry Harrison was the first one, and the other one was uh, Benjamin Harrison. Well, anyway, the son in between there, he died in Ohio, and they buried him, and while well, they're at the cemetery, the family noticed a friend of the family who, was, who died like 11 days prior that the grave was disturbed. And so they, uh, you know, brought this to the attention of the police mm -hmm. and they, you know, they checked and the grave was empty. Wow. So they had a guard on their, uh, on that grave to guard against grave robbers. Mm -hmm. And they did an investigation and they searched the local university and they found, they expected to find the other guy's body. Yeah. They found the, you know, the one that was the Pearson. Do you know about the Richards riot in St. Charles? Yeah. No, I don't. Oh my gosh, you guys. Um, okay, so the Richards riot in St. Charles. Uh, St. Charles had a one of the nation's leading doctors who had a medical school in St. Charles. And when you have a medical school, you one of the things you learn to do is put bodies back together, which means you have to start out with some bodies. And uh, at the at the time, there were pretty strict taboos 
against um, remains, human remains being used for scientific study. That was something that reserved for criminals, people who had lost their liberty. Um, and so it was very common for medical students, um, maybe not necessarily under their real names, under cover of darkness, to go grave digging, grave robbing, um, to steal bodies. And that happened up in St. Charles to a, a young woman named Mrs. Kenyon, whose, whose body had been um, stolen, removed from her gravesite, and her husband found out about it. And her husband was pretty sure he knew who was to blame. And there was like a full-on shootout in downtown St. Charles to try to return her corpse. And it's some wild history that we have super local. Um, because the, they talked about the, um, the students at the medical school dumping the body then off the cliffs into the fox to try to like get rid of it and get rid of the evidence. So it's, it's some intense stuff. And I, I believe... When was that? Um, last week. I'm, I'm going to give you last week. <laughs> I don't want to give you the wrong date, but I do know that the, the information is pretty easy to access online. So if you're interested, uh, Google Richards Riot um, about Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards was shot through the door of his house. The house is still standing. The bullet hole is still in the door. Uh, you can go and see it. And uh, he was injured during that process, but not killed. And they secreted him, secreted him away. He went out to Iowa, where he started a new college, um, <laughs> and shook the dust of the Fox Valley off of his heels and hightailed it out of here, which I don't blame him at all. Um, but there's, there's some really interesting accounts, one written in the King County history by the Kenyon family, and then another account written by his students, who then did go on to become doctors um, elsewhere, and so they wrote about it from their perspective. So comparing those two narratives is really interesting. All right, my friends, it is one o'clock. I am happy to stick around and answer any other questions. Um, Stacy, I don't know if there's anything else we need to do to close things out, but I guess not. Thank you so much for coming out to us today. I hope you enjoyed the and come back because we do this every month the third Thursday of the month at lunch and make sure you reserve your lunch ahead of time so that you get the best nosh around 100% thank you folks so much and sign up